everybody! So Lord of Shadows, the second book in Cassandra Clare's The Dark Artifices series has just been released. I want to give a big thanks to Simon Teen for sending me an advanced reader's copy of the book. I laughed, I cried, I got mad, I had all of the different feelings while reading this book. It is incredible. I am going to go ahead and talk about this book with all of you. If you've not read the book, please do not watch this review. There will be spoilers. There's just no way to talk about this book without revealing a bunch of spoilers. So turn this off and come back once you have read the book. You have been warned. <laughs> Alright, so this book basically starts off not long after Lady Midnight. It hasn't been that long. I'm thinking it's been about a few weeks. And we have the charade going on between Mark and Emma that she's dating him and that's the way she keeps Julian at arm's length because of the Parapetai curse which is absolutely horrible, by the way. When Lord of Shadows first starts off, we see Kit in the training room at the LA Institute, and he has one of his first encounters with Jace. Now, Jace tries to play it cool, like it's no big deal, and Kit doesn't know who this guy is. He doesn't know how to deal with Jace. It's really cute seeing these two Herondales. Jace just wants to connect with a blood relative, and Kit just doesn't care. He is still trying to plan his escape. He wants to get out of that institute and go back to his old life, which is impossible now that his dad has been ripped to shreds and is very, very dead. He's not coming back. No. As all that is going down, we have our LA Shadow Hunters off fighting a bunch of sea demons because once Malcolm Fade died and his body was lost in the sea, for some reason that brought forth all of the sea demons coming on ashore, killing mundanes, and all of that. So they keep having to battle all of them and things are not looking good. Once they finish off the demon and head back to the institute and find Jace and Clary there, they then find out that Clary and Jace are going off into Fairy because they found out that Sebastian Morgenstern left a weapon in Fairy that could destroy Nephilim, destroy all shadow hunters and they need to go and find this weapon and get rid of it. It's not a great mission for them to have to go on because of the cold peace and how shadow hunters and fairies are not on good terms right now. So fairy is very dangerous for shadow hunters. A little while later we have a moment between Clary and Emma. Clary asks Emma to pass along a message. Clary has been having these dreams that she is going to die soon and that is why she refused to marry Jace. Jace proposed to her and she said no. I know you guys. It hurts. But this is what she told Emma. If I do die, I want you to tell them, Jason and the others, that I knew. I knew I was going to die and I wasn't scared and tell Jace that is why I said no. I don't want Clary to die. I know. They're mortal. They die. But I do not want to see Clary's death. I don't want to deal with that. Before Clary and Jace leave, we find out that the Shalamans is going to be sending Centurions to the LA Institute to go and retrieve Malcolm Fade's body to hopefully get rid of all these sea demons coming to shore. Well, one of the other things that happens right before they leave is that Clary gives Kit James Herondale's ring. This is really great. It is a step in the right direction for Kit. He has a Herondale ring now and it's pretty much his first step into accepting that he is a shadow hunter, he is a Herondale, and I can't wait to see what happens with him in the future books. Now, let's talk about the Centurions because they caused a mess. Diego and Christina are back together and when the Centurions arrive, this girl runs up to Diego, grabs him and kisses his cheek, and we find out that he's been hiding a secret fiance named Zara Dearborn. Throughout the book, several of the Centurions, led by Zara Dearborn, cause a lot of trouble, and they are working for the cohort. It is a part of the Shadowhunter Society that wants to register all of the Downworlders and get basically tracking chips put on them, and they want to have complete control over them. They do not want the cold peace to end. They want things to get even worse and think that that's the answer to all of their problems. Zara is working for her father and trying to discredit Arthur and have her father made head of the Los Angeles Institute. And if he is made the head of the Institute, he will have more power and the cohort might get what they want, which is really bad for the Blackthorns especially because they still want to get Helen back from Wrangell Island. She's still just, you know, up there 
As all this is going down with the Centurions, Gwen Abnud, the leader of the Wild Hunt, shows up to the Institute asking Mark for his help in rescuing Kieran. Kieran has been sentenced to death by his father, the Unseelie King, for killing Ireland. Mark refuses and we start to think that maybe he really won't go and save Kieran, but we know better and Mark does end up going off to save him. Now before Gwen leaves, he leaves something very special for Diana. It is a golden acorn, a fair gift. And if she ever cracks it open, he will come when she summons him. He definitely has the hots for Diana, and it's so cute. I didn't see this coming in book two. I am really excited about this. This pairing is very interesting and fun. Later on, Mark sends a fire message to Emma and the others telling him he went after Kieran. They end up following behind him. Christina actually has this necklace that was a fairy gift to her family that works against fairy time, so they can kind of keep track of things and not get all weird on time by the time they get back to the mortal realm. It's, you know, wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. Had to say it. Had to say it. A lot of things go down in the fairy realm. Mark and Christina get cursed by some fairy girls and it's this binding curse. They tie their wrists together and they basically can't get real far from each other without enduring a lot of pain and then passing out. It is really bad. Their wrists get all bloody and it just needs to be broken. This is a really bad thing for them to have to try and live with. So that's one of the things that happens. Another thing that happens is that Julian gets tricked by a Leonan she thinking it's Emma and kisses it. And it's just, it's a mess. It's such a mess. Later on, they end up rescuing Kieran by threatening one of the Unseelie King's sons and Emma fighting one of his chosen warriors. When Emma defeated the warrior, she took off the helmet and saw her father at first, but then it wasn't her father and it was just a mess and it really messed with her feelings. The I, I can't even imagine how she felt, but it just tore her up. Before they fled the court, the king didn't believe that Julian would actually harm his son, but then one of his other sons, Adion, said something that really stuck with me. I'm going to go ahead and read this line. Many were in the Hall of Accords during the war. It was witnessed. He is a ruthless one, that one. He's basically referring to how Julian killed his endarkened father. Julian is a very ruthless person. Because of everything he's been through, he's had to become very ruthless. A short while later, after the Unseelie King's son Eric escapes, and the king and his court are chasing after them, they are then saved by this mysterious fairy named Neen. She turns out to be Mark's aunt. Now, back to Kieran. They have rescued him, but he has no memory of the fact that he and Mark are no more. They are no longer in a relationship. So it makes things very tense between everyone, and Kieran doesn't understand what is happening. While they are in the Seelie Court, because that's where they are now, Julian has a meeting with the Seelie Queen. The Seelie Queen informs him that she knows about the Parabatai curse and how he feels about Emma, and says that she knows a way to break the curse. She then goes on to make a deal with all of them once they're all gathered and saying that she can help in the cold peace and that she will help the shadow hunters if she is given the black volume. The Unseely King has been blighting the lands and making it to where shadow hunters magic will not work. That is one of the things that has been spreading throughout fairy. In fact, in all of the Unseely lands, shadow hunters cannot use their runes, their steles, their serif blades, it's all useless. They cannot use any of it. So it's really bad. And if that spreads into the mortal realm and it just spreads forever and ever and ever, there will be no shadow hunters. I don't think that is the actual weapon that Sebastian left to get rid of all of the Nephilim. I think there's one huge thing that we don't know about that is somehow going to destroy all of the shadow hunters. I will be really interested to find out in a couple of years what that is. The Seely Queen makes Kieran her emissary to the clave and hopefully they will believe everything he says. He cannot lie, so hopefully they believe everything, right? Yeah. One of the things before they can leave though is that Kieran has to swear an oath that he is going to stick to the plan, do what he says. He then tries to swear this to Mark, but then Julian says, no, you will not do this for Mark. Love complicates things and oaths should be free of entanglements. And then surprising everyone, Kieran goes and kneels in front of Christina and says, I swear fealty to you, Lady of Roses. And Mark then says, Kieran Kingmaker. Basically, they want to get rid of the Unseelie King and make Kieran's brother, Adeon, the Unseelie King. 
and help them to end the cold peace. Another thing that they decide on before they leave is that they're going to have to keep up this charade to Kieran that he and Mark are still together because that's the only way he's going to stick to his word. Later on, they are brought back to the mortal realm by the Wild Hunt. Now, back to the mortal realm, a lot went down while they were all in fairy. Malcolm Fade shows up with all of these sea demons. He is all really gross. I, I mean, he's not really alive. He's not really there. But he basically says he still wants Blackthorn blood. He is going to keep releasing all of these demons until he gets it. All of the Blackthorn children and Kit and Diana, they all flee the Institute off to the London Institute. Arthur stays behind and sacrifices himself so that they can all live. Right after Malcolm kills Arthur and brings Annabelle back to life and then Malcolm's brought back to life, Annabelle kills him and runs off with the black volume. So we're left with something else to deal with. Later on when all the Blackthorns and everyone meet up at the London Institute, they all start splitting up to try and find the Black Volume and Annabelle to hopefully get the cold piece done and over with. And things really don't go well. One of the things that happens is that when Jillian and Emma go off to Cornwall to find Malcolm and Annabelle's hideaway home, they meet Annabelle and Annabelle at one point tries to kill them. And it's just... It's, it's really bad. Let's move away from Cornwall for a minute and talk about Libby Tiberius and Kit and their mission at Blackthorn Manor. Their mission is to go to Blackthorn Manor and retrieve some Blackthorn papers and find out more about Annabelle and all of that. They're basically the two different groups of them. They are trying to find out more about Annabelle and find the Black Volume. That is what all of this is about. And they find this Aletheia Crystal at the manor and it holds all these memories. They end up going to the London Shadow Market to try and find a warlock or someone that can activate this crystal so they can see what it is all about. Well, they do find a warlock after a lot of trouble. When they see the memories held inside this crystal, it is absolutely heartbreaking. It is the memory of Annabelle's trial and conviction. She was tortured horribly before she was killed and that just drove her insane. She was mad at the end and she is crazy now as well. After they get this information and they are about to head on their way, everything goes to hell. They get in trouble for being over there. Livy gets injured and nearly dies. Magnus jumps in and saves the day and heals Livy back at the London Institute. Now, some other things that are going on throughout all this. Let's talk about Christina, Mark, and Kieran. This is an absolute mess. Kieran doesn't know what is going on. At one point, Kieran decides to contact one of his brothers, Adion, the one that the Seelie Queen wants to be made the Unseelie King. Well, when he shows up and Kieran has his conversation with him and tells him of their plans, kind of, his other brother, Eric, shows up. And Christina decides to snoop. And Eric tries to kill Christina, and then Kieran kills his brother, Eric. And Everything is all messed up now. Once they get back, um, some of the many things that are going on down at the Institute. Magnus is trying to break that curse binding between Mark and Christina. Drusilla helps an on-the-run Jamie, you know, Christina's would-be parabatai that disappeared. Well, he disappeared because the Dearborns want this object that their family has that can get them into fairy undetected. Well, they lie and say that the only people that can use this object to go into fairy like that is someone of their family. And so Zara got herself engaged to Diego. Diego plays along with it while Jamie keeps on the run with this object. We do see kind of what it does very briefly because Drusilla accidentally touches it at one point and she's all of a sudden transported somewhere and we see this pale haired boy and playing with a bunch of weapons and um, we don't know who this is but all of a sudden, she's brought back out of that wherever she was, and Jamie is gone with that object. Another thing that happened at the London Institute is that we get to see Jessamine Loveless again. Herondales can see ghosts, and so once Kit accepts his first rune, he is able to see Jessamine, and she's able to give them clues and pointers and help them out in some ways. Tiberius figures something really important out. We find out at one point that Malcolm and Annabelle used to pass messages by Raven to each other, but Tiberius thinks about it and then 
wonders if that might not be an actual literal thing. So he gets Kit to go with him and sneak off to the Blackthorn Manor. They actually travel through a really old portal in the London Institute to the manor and they find this statue with a raven and there's this opening where you can put a letter in it. So he puts a letter in it to Annabelle. One of the many things that went down is that Annabelle found Julian at one point and when he asked for the book, he said he needs the book to save his family. She said, I have told you what the book did to me. It has no use but evil use. You should not want it. It destroys families, people. She's about to continue on and he says, my family will be destroyed if I don't have the book. Annabelle is of a very different mindset than Julian and she continues to go back and forth with him and says, but think of what will be destroyed with this book out there in the world so much more. There are higher causes. Not to me, said Julian. The world can burn if my family lives, he thought. Julian is absolutely ruthless. He will do anything for his family. Annabelle gets scared off when Emma comes out and yeah. So after that and them catching some piskies and trying to find Annabelle again, she traps them in this old church and they nearly get killed. This is the church that Arthur was killed, Malcolm was killed by her, and she was resurrected in. It is curse. That black volume has cursed that church. Everything that was holy about it is gone. In order for Emma and Julian to get out of that church, they have to use their parabatai bond and some of their extra strong runes to get out of there. They are actually able to burn down that church, burn down stone, and they should not have been able to do that. That is part of the parabatai curse. They start to get these powers and everything just goes crazy and nuts. After they escape, Julian and Emma have a really big fight and there's something that Julian says that really stuck with me. And it basically was prompted by the fact that she made Mark believe that she loved him and he believes that Emma broke his brother's heart. It was something that really stuck with him and though when she was dating Mark it made him feel better because he couldn't hate either of them for caring for each other. Here's part of their conversation. What do you care? She demanded. What do you care how I feel about Mark? Because I needed you to love him, Julian said. His face was the color of ashes in the grate. Because if you threw me away and everything we had, it had better be for something that meant more to you. It had better be for something real, but maybe none of this is ever real to you. And later on, there. this is the line that really stuck with me. It just, it, it, it hurt to hear him say this, but after Emma says, what do you want from me, Jules? He says, I want you to know what it's like to be tortured all the time, night and day, desperately wanting what you know you should never want, what doesn't even want you back. To know how it feels to understand that a decision you made when you were 12 years old means you can never have the one thing that would make you truly happy. I want you to dream about only one thing and want only one thing and obsess about only one thing like I do. Julian, she gasped, desperate to stop him, to stop all of this before it was too late. Like I do with you, he finished. Like I do with you, Emma. I don't know how I got that so wrong. I thought you loved me, he said, almost in a whisper. I don't know how I got that so wrong. At this moment, he is just brutally honest and cruel, and I get really mad at him at this moment, but then I understand it because Emma's been lying to him. He's always been very honest about his feelings for her, and she knows about the curse, and he does not. After that, Emma storms out of the cottage into a big storm, and then a lot of other crazy bad things happen. The Unseelie King has dispatched the writers of Mananon to find the Blackthorns in the Black Volume and kill them if need be. Now, shortly after Emma goes out into the storm, she is surrounded by all these fairies that she has no idea who they are, but she knows they're not the Wild Hunt, and she knows they are enemies, and her and Julian start fighting them. They try to get them to stop fighting them and try to question them, but they are not having it. Emma actually ends up killing one of them with Cortana. His name is Fal, and she shouldn't have been able to kill him. But because it is one of these weapons that they are not equipped to come up against, it is not an angel-blessed weapon. It is a very different weapon, and 
she kills him and then she knows she is screwed because you don't kill something like that and not pay for it somehow later on. Actually, after killing Fal, Emma meets the eyes of one of the other writers, Ethna, and her eyes were murderous, disbelieving. You have slain an ancient and primitive thing, her gaze seemed to say. Be prepared for a vengeance just as ancient, just as primitive. Well, that's, yeah, that sucks. That sucks for Emma. And then we jump over to Kit, Livy, and Tiberius, and they decide to run from these riders. They end up getting saved, luckily, by Gwen Apnud and Diana, and all seems well, but then they all realize that Emma and Julian are back over in Cornwall and they need to be saved. So Magnus is sent to rescue them and a very awkward moment happens. Now, back in Cornwall, when Emma finally tells Julian about the curse, this is what happens. Julian says, I've been broken for weeks. I need to be whole again, even if it doesn't last. It can't last, she said. It'll break our hearts. Break my heart. Break it in pieces. I give you permission. <sighs> and they have a moment, and um, Magnus finds them barely clothed later on and realizes what's going on and suggests to them that they speak with Robert Lightwood, the Inquisitor, to see if there's some way to break this Parabatai bond so that they can be together somehow because the only way to actually break the bond that Julian knows of is to break all Parabatai bonds and that would be a really cruel thing to do and they don't want to do that. Now back at the London Institute, Drusilla at one point goes and gets Christina and brings her to meet up with Jamie. They have a great little reunion and she seems to forgive him for what he's done for the most part and begins to understand why he did what he did even though it hurts. So hopefully he's able to keep that object out of the Dearborn's hands because from what I've seen, yeah, let's just not let them have that. We don't need the cohort having that power. Nope. Let's move over into Idris and talk about Diana Rayburn. I really loved her in this book. I grew to love her even more in this book and I cried a bit for her while reading this book because we find out that she's transgender and I didn't see that coming. When she made that confession to Gwen that she was transgender, it was just so heartfelt, he was so accepting and he did not care. He really is into her. I, I really can't wait to see more of these two. I really want to applaud Cassie on bringing this into the Shadowhunter books. There's just so much that is brought into the forefront in these books that it just I, I, I love I love Diana. Diana's awesome and she is so strong and I don't even know what's gonna happen next for her but I just I really can't wait. Now while Diana is in Idris and trying to convey everything that they want to do with Gia Penhallow, she's the consul, she's the mother of Aileen Penhallow who is married to Helen Blackthorne. Well she definitely wants the cold piece gone so her daughter and her daughter's wife can return from Wrangell Island and be with their families. She tells Gia about their plans for the most part while leaving some tidbits out and later on Diana finds a blighted spot in Idris and a spot in the Shadowhunters country that runes won't work, seraph blades won't work, stelles won't work, and this really raises a lot of warning flags for everyone, which makes Gia bring in Robert Lightwood, who he goes to investigate it as well, and he confirms it. Let's move back to London for a minute, because Kieran finds out that Mark has been lying to him. And it's, it's, it's really heartbreaking. Kieran breaks my heart in many ways, many times over because I want to hate him, I want to love him at the same time. He uses that golden acorn to try and contact his brother once again and see what's going on and make sure his brother's all right. But his father answers the call and then reveals a lot of hard truths to him. 
and there is a sad moment between Karen and Mark where Mark says, you are not a monster, Karen. There is nothing wrong with your heart. Then Karen says, that cannot be true, for you were my heart. And later on, things seem to get better between all of them, but it's really heartbreaking to see all this go down and how Kieran doesn't truly know himself at this moment because he has some of his memories back, but it doesn't seem like he has everything in some ways or he does, he's not feeling them the way he should. It's just an absolute mess. And Mark is still torn between two worlds. So a part of his heart belongs to Kieran and a part of his heart belongs to Christina. But Kieran actually sees that he should really be with Christina because Christina is someone that's easy to love and it's not the same situation with Kieran. As they're all about to depart for Idris, the writers of the Mananon show up once again, Emma decides to go and fight them because they are holding this little girl hostage. They're about to kill her, and the only way to save her is to go fight them. So she goes out there to fight them. She eventually is joined by the rest of the Shadow Hunters, and a huge fight ensues. Things are not looking good for either side. And then Annabelle shows up holding the black volume, not cowering at all, and says, I am Annabelle Blackthorn. The black book is mine. The unsealy king, murmured Annabelle. Give him my regards. Tell him I remember him well and his name. The writers don't believe her that she knows his name, but she tells them that Malcolm knew him well and she learned his name as well. A name holds a lot of power among the Fae and they know this and this really starts to freak them out. And then Magnus shows up, uses magic to rip all their swords out of their hands and they are not pleased with this. They, they really are not amused with this at all. Etain says this is not finished and then they all disappear. This will be interesting to see how it plays out with them in the next book because I'm sure they will be back. After that, Magnus brings them all to Idris through Portal and I don't even know how I'm going to deal with talking about the ending of this book. My emotions feel very raw still from reading this book, especially the ending. Once they get to Idris and they go to start the council meeting, Magnus basically passes out. We find out that all of the warlocks are suffering from some kind of sickness, even Tessa. Annabelle agreed to testify her story and tell them that she killed Malcolm Fade because Zara is taking credit for that. That's what would help her father in gaining control of the Los Angeles Institute. So she agrees to do that on the condition that Magnus stays by her side, that Julian stays by her side, and Julian actually promises her that she can have Blackthorn Manor. It's crazy. There's no agreement about the black volume though among all of those promises. She does not say that she's going to give them that volume. Everyone starts arriving for this meeting. The cohort is there in droves. There are downworlders, shadow hunters, everybody that's meant to be there at the moment. Annabelle doesn't want to cooperate, but then she has to because she agreed to do it. And so Robert brings her forward to testify her story. Nobody believes it. They call her a dead thing. They call her all these names. They don't believe her say she can lie under the mortal sword. When things don't seem to be going their way and Annabelle still has the mortal sword in her hands, things just go downhill very, very fast. Now, one thing I want to point out before I talk about the ending of this book, Helen and Aileen are there to testify what is going on over up in the north at Wrangell Island and that the blight is up there as well. Once a now crazed Annabelle realizes things aren't going to go her way, the scene that started all the tears for me happened. During all of the fighting and everything going down, Robert Lightwood is killed by Annabelle. Emma fights Annabelle and destroys the mortal sword. Think about that for a moment. The mortal sword is gone and Annabelle kills Livy. I don't know how I'm going to deal with the weight of learning what happens next in this series. We have to wait until 2019 to find out what happens next. The one thing that really stuck with me though were Livy's last words. Ty, Ty, where are you? I don't know how Ty's going to deal with not having a sister. And especially you hear about twins, how they're so connected, but 
Ty also has his own issues that Livy really knows how to help him with. And without her, he's really going to have to um, figure things out even more so. I think he's going to really lean on Kit. I think this is going to prompt them to become pair of a tie. I don't even know how to deal with this book, to be honest. It is a wonderful book. It is a very painful book to read. I love it dearly. I will definitely be doing a reread of this probably before the next book in this series. I don't think I'm going to be able to do a reread right at the moment. I, I don't think I can handle it emotionally right now. I give this five stars. It is so well written. Everything is so vivid and deep and emotional and I, I just, I can't praise it enough. Lord of Shadows is fantastic. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, like this video, and comment and let me know what your favorite moment was from Lord of Shadows. I had so many, obviously, I marked a lot of them in here. There are some notes in here that are just for me to go back and look at, like Emma and her treats that she loves, and yeah, her love affair with food. That's a thing. I will talk to y'all later. Bye, guys.